and have her do it again. Hi, Jean, how are you? I'm good, Ro, how are you? I'm good. Thank you for all your help on this uh, class. No problem. I think the only one we don't have um, was there one other person that you were trying to get registered? Um, well, I think we're okay. Um, I was wondering about um, Sequoia. I forget her last name. She's Lamar Thorpe's assistant. Oh, okay. So I just wanted to make sure that you know one or both got it. As long as Lamar got it, I'm good. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah. So we have yeah. Lamar. Yeah, they were the last people that registered. Lamar, Aaron. Oh, Lamar did it. Oh, I have Lamar on here twice. Oh. So he might be, um, yeah. Yeah, okay, that must be it. Everybody else seems to be getting on, Laura, so haven't tried going I, I resent Kathleen the link. Yeah, I resent her the link. Um, so, Jean, um, next question. When everyone gets on, we do we have to... My understanding is we have to ask uh, the panelists if it's okay for us to record, right? Uh, yes, I believe so. You have okay. to get confirmation. But okay. I think I think Tanya's Tanya Tanya, are you on? I'm here. Oh, okay. Um, I see the recording is already on. Do we want I didn't. That? I didn't hit the recording on. So let's stop the recording. Yeah. I was like, whoa. <laughs> we don't need the pre recording the pre conversation. Yeah. Oh, maybe she maybe. Um, Somebody set it up to automatically record. And oh, yeah, Virginia may have, yeah. She might have. But yeah, you do usually have to get permission for every, from everybody that you're going to record before you start to record. Okay. Or get confirmation, pretty yeah. much.
Are we letting people in as they as they come in? Should we be letting them come in as they sign? They just come in. Um. I mean, I guess I would. You know, we're almost at eleven o'clock. Um. We're not going to talk or anything. Yeah. Can you um or Jean um like stop the recording? It looks like we're still recording as well. Oh, I thought I stopped it. No, no problem. Uh. Five plus good start. Thank you. Um, 11 5, let's get started. Um, this is a city panel class uh, on current updates in Pittsburgh, Antioch, Oakley, and Brentwood. Uh, we're going to have our first speaker, um, our very own fellow broker and vice mayor of Oakley, Aaron Meadows. Go ahead. Thank you. So I'm Aaron Meadows. Uh, Vice Mayor of Oakley and then longtime member of DAR going back to, I think, 1998. Uh, so I'll, go, I'll just go over a few things that are going on in Oakley um, over the last year and up to today. A year ago, our, our city manager uh, at that time resigned. We hired an interim city manager promoted from in, inside uh, a new interim city manager, Josh McMurray. Six months ago, uh, we swore him in as our uh, city manager. Uh, it, during his one year with us, and especially once he uh, was in the permanent role, there's been a lot of changes uh, made. Um, we, I'm sure you've all heard, have a new police chief. So as of uh, January, Paul Beard is our um, police chief. Uh, in the last month or so, we hired two lieutenants from within, uh, so promoted two sergeants to lieutenants, and uh, we're continuing to hire for uh, officer positions. And then earlier this year, I don't know who ranked it, but we were ranked as 11th safest city in California. Uh, we have an economic development director, Harumi, who is out constantly making contacts. Um, trying to bring in additional business. Uh, she was at ICSC in Monterey a couple months ago and will be in Las Vegas this month. Uh, the logistics center is still under construction. Right now, Amazon is uh, having another building built for them. And if you drive by, you can see it out there. Uh, that, that project, when complete, will be about 2 million square feet of space. Uh, big issue in Oakley has been our Cypress Corridor. Um, I guess the biggest reason is uh, when there's any kind of activity out there. Uh, there was a few years ago, there was two years with fires that blocked the road. Uh, so there's concerns about emergency access. If there's any uh, accidents on Cypress, east of Knights and Avenue, especially if they're fatal, it blocks the road. So we, we've been working on that. We've uh, gained an emergency uh, um, access out that goes out through Sand Mound out onto Holland Track, only for emergency purposes. We have uh, entered into a reimbursement agreement with uh, TI Capital out there for the Grand Reserve, which will um, allow Cypress Road to be built out to four lanes uh, sooner. I'll also work on uh, Bethel Island Road extending to the south down to Rock Slough. We're working right now, our staff is working now and, and trying to work with the county on extending Bethel Island Road from Rock, Rock Slough to Delta Road so that we have second access out of, um, out of the Cypress Corridor area. Uh, it, it's been a struggle in working with the county a little bit. Um, I know everybody assumes it's a, a completely an Oakley issue. Uh, in actuality, Oakley has an issue of building permit in that area in over three years, and the county is building Delta Coast right now. So uh, we really should be working together. A month or so ago, we also approved uh, a camera to document accident scenes. Uh, what does that have to do with the Cypress Quarter? Well, when we have a fate, a fatal accident, that road could be shut down for four to six hours. Uh, with this new camera, it 
uh, is more like an hour to two hour shutdown. So it'll save a lot of time. And uh, it's along the lines of a Matterport camera, which I'm assuming you're all aware of. Uh, and then we are also, if not so much Cypress Corridor, uh, we're just getting shut down, but we have uh, started working on design of Laurel Road to uh, go over the train tracks and out to Sellers Avenue, which will leave the traffic at uh, Cypress and Main Street. Uh, we are currently working on our update to our housing element. Uh, Oakley was designated at a 400 plus units of uh, very low and low income housing. Uh, our numbers uh, that came in from ABAG this cycle is actually lower than our last cycle. And then the last thing I'll uh, bring up is we're in the budget cycle, like everybody else on this call, uh, we're in the budget cycle for the 22-23 year. And uh, as of now, our budget looks good for next year. So. Okay. Thank you, Aaron. And I should have said this before, after um, all the speakers are done, we will have a little time for a, a little Q&A afterwards. Okay. Um, so thank you, Aaron, once again. And next up is Mayor of Antioch, Lamar Thorpe. Go ahead. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you for having us and uh, providing this opportunity for us to give uh, updates. And so I uh, certainly appreciate that. Uh, I am Lamar Thorpe and I am uh, the 41st mayor of Antioch and I happen to be the mayor on our 150th uh, anniversary, our sesquicentennial. Uh, so we're pretty excited uh, about that. Um, and the, uh, yesterday I had the opportunity of delivering our state of the city address. So I have some, some stats that are pretty fresh off my mind. So I, uh, I'm happy that uh, I got to do that. Uh, uh, got to do that and then get to share some of that information with all of you. Um, as most of you probably know, uh, Antioch um, has had uh, an interesting history. We're one of the oldest cities in California. Uh, we were founded a few years after, or incorporated, founded a few years after uh, the state of California was uh, officially became a state. Uh, and, uh, and of course, a few uh, years after that, officially was incorporated in 1872. Uh, and since then, we've had some interesting, interesting things happen. So I'll start uh, kind of in the area of uh, racial reconciliation. Uh, Antioch was one of the original cities that, uh, that um, you know, has, has had a, a terrible history when it came to early Chinese immigrants uh, in our community. As most of you probably know, early Chinese immigrants uh, built the railroad, they built the levees that we see in the Delta. They worked on the uh, Black Diamond Mines. Uh, and so there, there was a lot of proud history that's been uh, overshadowed and, uh, and some misdeeds that have been committed. We literally burnt down uh, uh, Chinatown here in, uh, in Antioch uh, uh, sometime about a hundred years ago and purposefully expelled Chinese immigrants uh, over that period. And Chinese immigrants are not the only groups that have been historically expelled. Uh, during World War II, Italian Americans were not welcome, uh, not only in Antioch, but through our country and were sent to camps. Uh, similarly, uh, so were Japanese Americans and Japanese immigrants. And so uh, I can go on and on about, uh, about uh, the, the history with different groups in, in Antioch, but I think you get the gist of what I'm saying. Uh, so we were proud to be one of the first cities in California last year to officially apologize as Chinese immigrants, which interestingly enough, uh, became a trend with other cities, major cities like Los Angeles, San Jose, San Francisco, and others uh, to do the exact same thing. But we didn't just offer an apology. We work, we're, working to, we're working really hard uh, to, to really focus on the concept of reconciliation, what that means for our community and what that means for the communities that have been impacted by our previous actions. Uh, and so we have two consultants that we've hired, one that's working for the city, another that's working for the historical society. Uh, to help us uh, through those efforts as we find ways uh, to publicly uh, reconcile uh, or, uh, or bring um, truth to power when it comes to racial reconciliation. So we're talking, of course, exhibits. We're talking about uh, uh, living museums outside uh, in our downtown and, and designating 
what was once Chinatown as, as Antioch's historic uh, Chinatown, uh, and so on and so on. On the area of climate change, we've certainly taken that very serious. Uh, we know that the ice caps are melting, and as a result of that, you're going to have sea level rise, and you're also going to have increased salination uh, throughout the Bay, and including the Delta. Uh, and so as a result of that, uh, we've invested uh, about $110 million in a project that will build the uh, Northern California's first uh, brackish water desalination plant. Uh, and so that's, of course, currently under construction, but we're very, very proud of that because we are not uh, waiting for climate change to happen. We just know that climate change is in fact happening uh, and we're dealing with it uh, in, in the most appropriate way. We've also recently passed a policy that will zero out our, uh, our gas guzzlers that we have uh, for a city's fleet. So we're, folk, we're now transitioning to zero emission vehicles and that will also include our police department. Uh, and so we look forward uh, to uh, starting to, to uh, phase out uh, gas gas heating vehicles. So we're pretty excited about that too. We also uh, banned any uh, oil and gas uh, oil and gas drilling in the city of Antioch. Uh, we've uh, we've decommissioned a pipeline that was fueling the um, the uh, that was sending that was sending uh, fuel to the um, not fuel but oil uh, to the Richmond refinery. Uh, and in addition to that, last night or like this past Tuesday, we uh, sent a resolution to the county uh, asking them to, to do exactly the same thing that we're doing, which is banning oil and fracking throughout the county. Uh, not everybody will agree. <laughs> I'm not asking for agreement. I'm just sharing the information that's happening uh, in Antioch. Um, in terms of fiscal accountability, the, the, the city certainly is in good shape uh, about 10% of cities during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic in California did not see furloughs and did not see uh, layoffs as a, as a result of their strong uh, revenue and the diversity in their revenue streams. And Antioch happened to be uh, in that category. Uh, so we're very excited about that. Uh, one of the main reasons we were in that category was because of our larger retail uh, and of course, because of the cannabis industry that has come uh, to Antioch. So that's helped us out a lot. And I'm always thankful to the good people of Brentwood for continuing to fuel our cannabis industry here uh, in, in, in Antioch. Uh, and so um, Measure W, which was a measure that I co-authored along with Councilwoman Monica Wilson, uh, which passed a few years ago, uh, where we made the strong commitment, not just to fund our police department, but to focus in other areas such as uh, youth programming and uh, quality of life issues uh, is doing pretty well. We anticipated that in our 20, 21 budget cycle, we would we anticipate about nine, 14 million uh, in additional revenue as a result of Measure W. Uh, we actually came in at 19.4 million. Uh, and so uh, for the first time in a long time, Antioch's had quite a bit of money and we don't really know what to do with it, uh, but we're excited that the that the funding continues uh, to come in. Um, in. In addition, I wanna point out that uh, uh, a few years back when I was a member of the city council, I had asked us to fully fund our OPEB obligation. We had been on this system of, of PAYGO, uh, where you just pay uh, what you can, uh, and it was unacceptable. And so we decided to make a uh, $1.3 million contribution to our OPEB obligations. Uh, so we're actually on target to meeting some, uh, some of our obligation. And as a result of that, we were able to save uh, or we had a reduction in our overall OPEB obligation by $25 million uh, over the life of our, of our, uh, of our, uh, of our, um, of, uh, of our um, liability. Um, I can go on and on about the good uh, fiscal stewardship that we've been uh, conducting. We have a budget reserve and a budget stabilization fund that's over $40 million. So that's, that has been uh, pretty good. Uh, residential construction uh, has continued uh, to uh, flourish in the city of Antioch and we anticipate more residential construction. We've recently approved other additional projects that will be coming online uh, that will not be your traditional uh, single family homes, but we're now going to see a mix of more townhomes and condos. Uh, so we're pretty excited about that. A little higher density, uh, a little different than what we've done in the past, uh, but we're, we're really trying to optimize on space and density and uh, continue to make Antioch a continue, we have a stated goal of making sure that Antioch stays affordable uh, and not out of reach uh, for most people. 
Um, overall, um, we've also been focused on public safety. Uh, public safety has been a huge, I've only lived in Antioch for 10 years, and in those 10 years, public safety has always been a concern of everybody's. Uh, so what we've done uh, is we took a deep dive look at uh, kind of our hiring practices uh, for the police department a few years ago. And what we learned from that is that only twice in the last 20 years, twice, have we met our objectives of uh, how many authorized officers we could hire. And, uh, and, so, and it seems that we've had this attrition problem for quite some time uh, with having police officers on, on our streets. Uh, so one of the things that we've focused on is, of course, uh, police reform. Uh, police, we, last year we passed one of the largest, uh, most historic police reform uh, packages in the city's history. Our police officers now have body cameras, uh, vehicle cameras, uh, in addition to changing our hiring practices to ensure that, uh, that um, Antioch is not a stop for officers with troubled past. And we recently voted on our independent oversight board. So we did it quite a bit in the area of, uh, in the area of uh, police reform, but the, I think the two most important factors that we've done is uh, authorizing the uh, the uh, being able this year we will be breaking ground on our uh, first uh, non police uh, mental health crisis response team. Uh, that will come online in, in about two or three months uh, it'll be the first in, in, in our history and certainly it will be the first in the county uh, and so we're pretty excited about that. That along with leasing uh, the executive in so that we can have a place for uh, those living on our streets uh, to go uh, should help alleviate a lot of the responsibilities that we've placed on our law enforcement, uh, where we have somehow over the years redefined what law enforcement means to, to somehow become social work. We don't want our officers out there social workers. We want them fighting crime, preventing crime, and making sure that uh, those who should not be in our city committing these types of acts are not here. And so our mobile mental health crisis response team, the hotel and having workers on our streets moving chronically homeless individuals into bridge housing, getting them the stability and care that they need so that they can then be, um, they can then uh, be uh, assisted by the county towards permanent housing should alleviate a lot of the responsibility uh, that law enforcement currently have. Uh, and again, our focus is of course, uh, reducing violent crime. Violent crime overall, has gone down and since 20, I forget what year, but a few years ago, violent crime did start to go down. Um, but gun violence continues to keep the overall number high. And so it's a, it's a, it's a huge problem. Uh, so one of the things that I announced yesterday uh, during my State of the City address was that um, we would in fact, um, uh, that I would specifically request a budget allocation for the shot spotter program. Uh, we've seen that that's been working very effectively on our freeways. Uh, and I know that the, the county is responsible for that CHP. Uh, and we think that that will be something instrumental for the city of Antioch. And we've made it perfectly clear that if you come and commit these types of uh, crimes in Antioch, you're, you're gonna be found, you're gonna be prosecuted and you're gonna end up in prison. Uh, and so uh, that should help again, uh, our law enforcement uh, individuals uh, continue to do their job. Uh, so uh, with that, that's kind of my report as it relates to one of the greatest cities God ever created, and that's the city of Antioch. Okay, thank you so much, Mayor Thorpe. And uh, next up uh, for Pittsburgh, we have Jordan Davis, Director of Community and Economic Development. Take it away. Good morning. Thank you, Ro. Thank you all for having me today. Quite a bit going on in Pittsburgh. So want to touch on some of the highlights. Uh, happy to answer any questions later on during the question answer period. But uh, we, we do have quite a bit going on and a lot to report. Um, perhaps most excitingly, at least for the former planner and me, are some major developments taking place in Pittsburgh, most notably two hotels. Uh, in the next couple of months, we'll have a groundbreaking for our courtyard by Marriott right here, proximate to City Hall and the Pittsburgh BART station. We have adopted, actually it was adopted about 10 years ago, the Railroad Avenue specific plan. And we're really starting to see that take, uh, 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 take hold 
and more developments in and around our BART station, which opened up in 2018. We've got a large scale multifamily development called the Atchison, which is right on the railroad avenue corridor within walking distance of the BART station. Uh, the new Starbucks that will be going in along with the hotel really points to some new uh, development in Pittsburgh that's unlike really anything that we've seen. We continue to see the residential development in the uh, areas west of Bailey Road and, and towards the southern end of the city that traditional single family development, but we're starting to mix in uh, more dense multifamily development and bringing some new products online, which is something that our residents and uh, other folks who have visited Pittsburgh have been asking for for several years now. So really excited to see that happening. Um, we're also looking at a potential redevelopment of the USS UPI property, uh, commonly known as, as POSCO. Uh, that property owner is in contract to sell that land. And so we're excited to see what kind of job creation opportunities are gonna come along with that redevelopment. And in addition, on the other side of downtown, our uh, decommissioned power plant, the NRG power plant that sat vacant for years now, has recently been purchased by a developer who's going through the process to create a specific plan for that area and is proposing up to 2,500 new homes, as well as commercial along the waterfront and a job creation center in that area. So we're really excited to see that take place. Um, as I mentioned, housing keeps going, never really stopped here in Pittsburgh. We're currently bringing on uh, two to 250 units a year, at least in new housing starts. Uh, in total, we've got several thousand that are in the pipeline that have received some form of entitlement. And so those will be continuing to be built for the next couple decades. Uh, we've also been real creative on how we can bring commercial opportunities to some of our existing residential areas. Uh, it's no secret that west of Bailey Road, there has not been a lot of commercial opportunity, at least not keeping up with the amount of housing that's going out there. So the city council uh, looked for creative solutions to utilize some of that area that had been identified for, uh, for a community park. They actually relocated the community park, so we're not losing any park space, but they identified that corner as a key opportunity site for some commercial development. And we're working with that developer to bring that commercial development online. Um, in fact, we've been talking about what kind of infrastructure is needed in that area. And we're gonna have some items going before the city council in the next few weeks in order to try to promote that development and bring it online. Now, all of this is currently being done while we're in the middle of a general plan update, a uh, comprehensive general plan update, which we're currently undertaking. Uh, we are going through the environmental process of that, but that's really creating a vision for what the city is gonna look like over the next 20 years. And we're really excited to incorporate different components of economic development and land use and really looking at how we continue to push Pittsburgh forward. And along with that, one of the key items that we're processing concurrently is our first climate action plan. So the city is um, uh, in contract with a consultant who is doing a review of our greenhouse gas inventory and will be preparing the city's first climate action plan that will be adopted subsequent to the general plan. Uh, in January, the city council adopted the city's first economic development strategic plan in 25 years. And that's really setting the tone for how the city is both looking at retaining uh, the workforce here in Pittsburgh, retaining the businesses that we have, but also looking at bringing in more jobs, more opportunities. So folks that are uh, living and playing in Pittsburgh can also work in Pittsburgh. And that's really exciting to see take place. And we're continuing to have discussions um, on a weekly, monthly, every opportunity the city council has, it seems like, to talk about what the implementation actions of the economic development strategic plan are. And so that's really had a very strong response and we're excited to see that take place. Um, the city has been working to bring on a dedicated core team. CORE is the organization that is overseen by the county that does outreach to our unhoused populations to provide them services. And the city of Pittsburgh currently has its own dedicated core team. So we have a dedicated uh, couple staff members from the county who work just in Pittsburgh in order to try to address uh, some of the issues that some of our unhoused populations are facing, particularly 
in some of our main corridors where we're seeing a lot of those folks congregate. Um, we do have a, a, a retirement. We're very uh, sad to see Chief Brian Addington retire. Uh, we're currently recruiting for a new police chief. That recruitment's underway. Chief Addington is with us still while that recruitment takes place and he'll be around to help ease the new chief into that role. Uh, very uh, sad to see him go, but very excited for the new chief that will be joining Pittsburgh. For more information to come on that. And the last thing is uh, Pittsburgh's continuing to look at its infrastructure. Last Monday, not this past Monday, the Monday before, uh, the city council authorized uh, the sale of uh, water bonds in order to uh, make massive renovations to our water treatment plant. The uh, city of Pittsburgh has a lot of infrastructure that was built at the turn of not this century, the previous century, that really needs to be replaced. And we're recognizing that. We're working to make sure that the citizens of Pittsburgh, uh, the residents of Pittsburgh, I should say, have, um, you know, the infrastructure that's necessary to support those jobs, support all that new housing development. And so the city council has recognized that we're moving forward, we're taking actions to make that happen. In addition, we've got the grants, the $4.5 million uh, class four bicycle facility that will run for a uh, long railroad from State Route 4 to Leland. That'll be kicking off here this summer. And that's really going to do quite a bit for our railroad out there, specific plan development. So we're excited to see that take place. We also received multiple other grants for improvement of the Railroad Avenue corridor. And we're continuing to work on our downtown, looking at the jewel that that is and uh, trying to identify ways that we can bring more users, expand uses, and also, frankly, streamline uh, the permitting process. Right now, uh, one of the major uh, items of feedback that we get is that the permit process takes longer than folks would like. Now, we say that understanding that developers would like the permit process to happen tomorrow, and it doesn't always work like that, but we are taking steps in order to streamline the placement of new businesses in the downtown area, and also to make sure that folks can get those building permits uh, more efficiently. And a lot of that goes back to our launch of the Excella software which the city's brought on. So our permitting system is 100% online now. We've already seen major increases in efficiency. And it's also really helped with our code enforcement efforts, which is helping to make the city of Pittsburgh a uh, much better place to live, improving quality of life, and addressing some of those blight issues that we've experienced. So plenty of going on in Pittsburgh. I could probably go on and on, but I'll stop there and happy to answer any questions. All right, thank you so much, Director Davis. Next up is Brentwood City Manager, Tim Olden. Go ahead. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me. Uh, City Manager here in Brentwood, I've been here about two and a half years. I had the unfortunate pleasure of starting a month before the pandemic started, so I'm still waiting to see Brentwood in its uh, normal state. I do have a few updates I wanna share with you, and pictures are worth a thousand words, so. A few quick facts about Brentwood in case you're not familiar. We're not as old as Antioch, but coming up on our 75th anniversary in January 2023, and we'll have a year long of celebration through some new events and some current events. We have a $315 million overall budget, 72 million of that is from our general fund, which provides discretionary funds for police and other services, and about 30% in reserves. Double A plus credit rating, the new population estimate, almost 65,000. Median household income, 115,000. And we've had quite a bit of development as well. We've averaged about 300 single family building permits a year the last three years, and 450 multifamily permits during the last two years total. And our forecast going forward over the next two years is to see about 175 single family units. Don't have any in the queue yet for multifamily, but there are some possible projects coming and about 250,000 square feet of commercial. We're working on several different public works projects that will work ourselves towards build out. We're working uh, on our wastewater treatment plant expansion. It's a $50 million project. Our water treatment plant will undergo a $100 million project. And we're working closely with the region on the Los Vaqueros Dam to increase the capacity 
as we're going to continue to see increasing drought issues. And so more storage is, is key to making sure we've got plenty of water supply. We're working with the property owner and the city of Antioch on extending the Sand Creek Road extension. And this will connect our communities better and also open up some more development opportunities. In particular, we're working on this 350 acre privately owned planned business park that would have office, commercial, retail, open space, and also multifamily development. This is our innovation center at Brentwood. We're hoping to be a, a large job generator over the next decade or more. We have two prospects already looking in this area. Costco has submitted an application and La Quinta Hawthorne, a dual branded hotel, is also in the planning process right now. And related to that innovation center at Brentwood, we have the Highway 4 McCollumy Trail bike and pedestrian overcrossing that will connect Brentwood to Antioch. And that's uh, just now starting construction. For economic development, we're continuing to work on our downtown with getting a Main Street America certification, have an executive director now in place with the Downtown Business Coalition, and working on a few other um, issues that will help us obtain that accredit accreditation. Working with Harvest Time Brentwood, uh, working on a documentary and funding their efforts to continue to promote the ag tourism and the UPIX in our surrounding area. And then this map here shows the enhanced infrastructure financing district that we're working on with the county and one for that innovation center at Brentwood that I highlighted just earlier in this pink. And then our older part of town along Brentwood Boulevard and downtown where any new investment that comes in, any new development, that those tax revenues would be shared back in part with the city to further reinvest back into the community, uh, primarily through infrastructure. So a great financing tool that we're working on and should be in place in the next few months. From a community development standpoint, we are updating our housing element. This is a state required document that details what kind of housing the community would like to see within the confines of the state law. Also trying to reduce any barriers to housing development to again, encourage more affordable housing uh, inventory opportunities for the, for the community. Looking at updating our zoning code, it's been an ongoing project, but we are likely to see some things like reducing the number of car washes, gas stations, um, even uh, tobacco shops, et cetera. So those kind of undesirable businesses in the community. And then this big one here is an open space land use initiative the city council is proposing to be on the November ballot. And this would be an overlay over several open space, public and privately owned parcels in the city to ensure that they can't be rezoned into higher intensity development without going back to the, the voters on another ballot measure. So that's in process now and is expected to be wrapped up by August when the deadline is for the November election. So we'll see if we can get there. Police services, uh, working on various different initiatives throughout the community to better engage the community. And as Mayor Thorpe mentioned, better engaging those who are, who are marginalized and make sure we have better relationships between police and the community while still taking care of the bad guys. And a lot of community events and also recognizing some mental health issues that we need to be more sensitive to and working through that. Fire, we don't have our own fire agency with the city, but we have been using the services of the fire district. And for those who've been paying attention over the years, it's been a significant concern for our community on the fire response timing. Just since 2021, we've had now fire CFDs put in place that any new development as they come into the city have to annex in and pay those additional fees. Also updated the fire impact fees that the fire district charges. Our district received some Measure X funding through the sales tax initiative passed by the voters last year and got a sizable contribution that will help contribute towards more fire stations and apparatus and really again, reduce that uh, fire impact uh, timing issue for the community. They have announced that they're going to open up the Oakley station June 1st, which will benefit not only Oakley, but also Brentwood. And then they're consolidating with the county's fire district, July 1. So that process has been underway for, for some time and now we'll be ready for a transfer of command on July 1st. That will immediately bring additional resources to the Brentwood community through an additional battalion unit at the existing fire station 52 on the west side of the city 
and then they are planning to build two new fire stations in the next two to three years on the northwest side of the city of Empire and Amber, and then downtown uh, where there's an existing station that's been closed for a decade or more and rebuild that fire station. So uh, great movement there. Uh, Chief Helmick from the fire district deserves a lot of credit for really moving this forward with the fire board as well. Parks and Recreation, uh, we have a wonderful community center, senior center and aquatic center that offers lots of different programming I won't go into, uh, but hopefully your customers are aware of the quality of life that our Parks and Rec offers also through all the trail systems, et cetera. We just opened up a disc golf course at Creekside Park. Community's enjoying and adding some bathrooms to Garen and Creekside Parks. These are some initiatives of the city council that we're moving forward on. We've got quite a bit of public art that development pays for, and we have two coming, one out on Sand Creek and one out on Brentwood Boulevard, showcasing in some history and tradition of our community, including working on a diversity and inclusion uh, public art piece that's, that's in the works right now as well. We're also moving forward on a 20 year planned uh, Sand Creek sports complex that would have two to three various fields on the city owned parcel. And then in that bottom graphic, again, conceptually from a few years ago that will be updated to the west there, uh, the Contra Costa Water District owns that piece and we'll probably add another two to three soccer fields on that. So great opportunities for the sports of the community. And then we have as a part of a development agreement from almost 15, 20 years ago out at the Trilogy area, we are working on an amphitheater. This is the Vineyards at Marsh Creek Amphitheater that could seat anywhere from 2,500 to 3,000 uh, patrons seeing concerts, plays, and other community engagement activities at that amphitheater. So that's on the uh, southwest side of the city. It's in the design phase right now and working through updating the environmental work that was done a few years ago. And with changing state laws, we have to update that CEQA analysis. And while not a city project per se, we did want to share the new Brentwood Los Medanos College opened up, had a ribbon cutting last week and offering a great amenity for our community, especially for those um, um, on, well, through all the community, through all the region and a beautiful campus if you haven't seen it yet. And uh, any questions? So we'll pause at that point. Thank you so much. Um, I, I have a question. Well, go ahead, Patrick. <laughs> Does everybody else have, or did you have a question? You do, yeah, I just wanted to go first. Did you have a question, Ro? No, I don't. I was just going to say, are no, you going to ask a question? <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, I, I, I'm interested to know what's going on with the uh, expansion of Lone Tree at um, Fairview that the railroads keep scuttling? Did we finally give up on that? Great question. The uh, overcrossing that's being planned is multi-million dollars and the city has chased a couple different grant opportunities and doesn't get awarded it because it's not an active line. If it was an active line, we think we'd be more competitive with getting that done and then that would lead to the expansion of the roadway. We do have a capital improvement project planned related to a school site being planned off of Lone Tree uh, with the Brentwood Unified School District, and that will expand the road for you know, half a mile. So not as much as we'd all like to see, but it will be incremental. Where's that at, the, ha the school? That's up the street, you mean? Tim, you're on mute. Who's on mute? We couldn't hear you if you were talking. That's what Joseph. You were. Uh, am I? You can hear me now. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So the school site is being located here, just south oh. of the Brentwood Muslim Community Center, and the road expansion will be from Lone Tree all the way, at least through Tilton, or maybe it goes to all the way to Amber's Lane. And then also improve the Smith Road here as related to that school project. Oh, okay. 
Now, is is the holdup on the overpass because, or the end? It's an underpass, right? Uh, at the railroad tracks. I don't remember if it's over or under. I believe it's over. Well, it was an underpass, and the problem is the railroad keeps kicking the can down the road. So last time we had the money for the for the steel they wanted, they wanted two tracks put in. You know, which you know they're just playing games with us. So, yeah. Do we ever talk about? Do we ever look at going to our congressman or something to try to get a little help on this? I don't know if we've reached out to Congress. I know the road. I mean, because they've obviously been. I mean, you're you're you probably you haven't been here for the whole time, but yeah, we we had a really great project. It was going to be concrete. They said they didn't want concrete. They wanted steel. We didn't have the budget for steel. So then we finally got the budget for steel, and then uh, then they wanted two tracks for a, a, a track a, a line that's never been used in forty years that I've been here. You know, um, you know, it's technically active, but literally not, as you well know. So, yeah. And every every two or three years, they'll put a press release out talking about how they're going to increase traffic on there, you know, which is just, you know, they don't want to lose it right away. But, sure. um, but yeah, I mean, I think we need some help because, as you know, the railroads are above all the rules of man and God. So, you know, there's not yeah. much we can do. Yep, they're in charge for sure. But, it, but it's a horrible traffic jam and it's only going to get worse as they build. And now they've got that Bluebird Village going up, the school you're talking about. That's only going to acerbate the problems. And then there's still that development on the north side of Lone Tree that eventually will be built, you know, between O'Hara and, and uh, Main Street. So, so there's a lot of growth that's still going on over there that's only going to increase the traffic. So, you know, we really need to, you know, make them let us build it, you know. Agreed. Yeah, because I know doing an overcross is out of the question because those are like more than gold, rarer than, you know, uranium. But um, and I think an overpass doesn't work either, does it? Well, for the train, it will, but we still need to widen the Lone Tree Way. And with that additional traffic coming from those proposed developments remain to be seen if they'll be approved or not. They'll have to contribute towards those improvements through those development impact fees. Right. And do we still have the development impact fees that we had set aside or did those get reallocated? Still set aside. Just okay. not enough. Because yeah, I wondered about that. Yeah. Because we had the Winco and the Rose Garden and a couple others. Sure. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for that. Absolutely. Thank you, Patrick. Um, for anyone else who has questions, just raise your hand and we'll unmute you. I'm um, saying that, uh, Jordan White, why don't you go ahead? Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, my question is for Jordan Davis. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, Jordan, I had a question in regards to the old golf course that's right there on West Leland. What mm -hmm. are you guys going to do with that? We're currently processing a project uh, called the Pittsburgh Tech Park. So we have received a proposal to rezone and develop a portion of the golf course, not the entire golf course, but a portion of that golf course for development of a tech park. And the idea here would be that this would be an area to supply um, space for things like data centers, possibly some offices and some green uh, energy type uses potentially in that area in order to redevelopment, uh, redevelop it and uh, add, add some value to that area. That would be on the eastern half. The western half, approximately 75 to 80 acres, is planned for a regional park facility. Uh, we actually have an item going before the city council on uh, Monday night to approve a five-court indoor basketball facility uh, just north of the golf course. But along with that, we'll be uh, presenting the preliminary plans for phase one to provide soccer fields on the on the south side of West Leland Road on the form, on a portion of the former golf course property, which would be the first phase in developing a regional sports complex in that area. Also as well, quick question, I'll let you go. Is the, the new apartments on West 10th Street, you know, right there across the street from Fernandez Towing, is that another affordable housing? Yes, that's an affordable housing project that does have a commercial component. So that's approximately 50 units, as well as several thousand square feet of commercial development in that area. Thank you. All right, um, Doofy, do you want to ask your own question? I know you chatted with me regarding it.
Yeah. You can start your video if you want. I just wanted some clarification as to the hotel and Costco. Are they already confirmed or do they still need to be voted on? Both of those projects have submitted applications for review and are being currently reviewed by staff and should be available approximately late summer for the hotel for planning commission consideration. And then Costco has some more environmental work to do and I believe late fall before it'd be up for consideration formally. Hey, thank you, Melody. I know uh, some of uh, my colleagues are watching all together. Go ahead, Melody, did you have another question? <laughs> no, I'm fine, thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, does anyone else have any uh, more questions to ask any of our panelists? I have a question for Aaron uh, regarding the train station in Oakley. What's going on with, with that? So the, the authority up that's running it is in design review. Or it's, it's being designed right now. And it's moving forward. And then we have uh, allocated money through our uh, capital improvement program to uh, build a parking lot and roads for it to access the, the platform. The platform will be between basically Ace Hardware and Second Street. Thank you. And do we have like an estimated uh, completion date? I don't have an estimated completion date. I would imagine would go within the next three to five years. All right, thank you, Aaron. You're welcome. Thank you, Jody. Um, does anyone else have any other questions? I have a quick question for Aaron. They incorporating some safeguards for the Patrick, Patrick, bring it up. Yeah. Patrick, you're bringing up. Patrick, 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 you're cutting off a lot. Oh. <laughs> okay, we'll go to James and then go back to Patrick. James, go ahead. You're on mute, James. Okay, can you hear me now? Okay, I have a question for Mayor Thorpe. Go ahead. So, um, hello again. Um, you know, I've come to some council meetings and I've spoken before, um, but what I'd like to do is again, speak on the topic of the homelessness. And I know Eric has done a lot. I know you've worked very hard on this and you have a lot of um, projects that you're really proud of, but I still see a significant issue uh, even though we're doing it as much as you can, and I'm acknowledging that, um, especially for the older residents who are downtown. And I hear a lot of conversations back and forth from both sides. You know, the old people in Antioch, you know, don't want things to change, but a lot of them have been here a long time, have paid their taxes to build, which they say is the greatest city in the world, and are suffering living downtown. I mean, it is significantly impacting their quality of life. I'd like to know what you still have planned to help reduce the amount of homelessness crime that's affecting the downtown residents. Thank you. So I've never referred to old people versus this and that. I talked about the new Antioch versus the Antioch of yesteryear. And I think when we say that, we're specifically talking about the way we used to do things and the way things used to be done. And that there's a new approach to doing things. In the past, we never dealt with homelessness. We always pointed the finger at the county and said, county, it's your responsibility. Uh, come uh, do something about the homelessness. Uh, and after years of doing that, we realized, oh my God, they're still homeless on our streets and they're the exact same people who've been there for, for, for a long, long time. Uh, we've spent millions of dollars and the city attorney, the city, the city manager uh, of Brentwood, Tim Ockham can tell you about this. We spend millions of dollars chasing people from corner to corner. We have a police department where, where we specifically created a new unit called, well, a few years ago, we created a new unit called the community engagement team that specifically dealt with uh, homeless issues. Uh, code, uh, code enforcement. A lot of when I was first elected to the city council five years ago, 
uh, I have to say about 80% of their time was being spent on uh, homeless uh, complaints. Uh, public works, the reason we started an abatement team in our public works department was specifically to deal with the encampments and, and, and since then has turned into something bigger, which we were excited about because we're now dealing with lighting and landscaping and whatnot. Uh, and so we spent millions of dollars chasing people from corner to corner to no end. Uh, and so our new approach is to specifically house people. We realize that if we don't house people, they're not going to be housed. And, it, and in particular, if we don't zero in on the chronically homeless, who where most of these complaints are driven by, uh, then we're just going to continue to see the same uh, complaints. So we're specifically, uh, our goal, our stated goal is to specifically deal with the encampments, but only by being able to place people uh, in shelter in some type of housing. What we've embraced is this concept of bridge housing, where we temporarily stabilize people and we recognize that it doesn't matter how many resources I come to you from the county, if you're chronically homeless, you're not just gonna get up one day and go seek these services and change your life or turn your life around in, in, in 2.5 seconds. It just doesn't happen that way. And so we wanted to create an opportunity for folks to be stabilized. Uh, and so that was the purpose of the, uh, of the hotel. Uh, in terms of crimes uh, in downtown associated with homeless, uh, I know we have certain, you know, we've had, as we see everywhere, Brentwood, Pittsburgh, and Oakley see the same thing, fires, because people uh, start fires and, and uh, they do them in very dangerous places. Uh, we've had, you know, a lot has been associated with homeless in terms of like illegal dumping, where we've come to learn that in actuality, where there's an encampment and you start to see a little trash, other people bring trash and create even a larger problem than the people who are already there. Uh, and so, uh, so we can, so, so, so we've recognized those things, but ultimately, uh, we believe as we saw, as we saw, uh, James at the railroad tracks, at the Amtrak station that has now been cleared up of homeless encampments, when we actually invested in putting people in rooms and then moving them over to Delta landing over at, uh, at in Pittsburgh, uh, it actually worked. It actually worked. So I hope that some of those folks that you're talking to are willing to embrace the ideas and changes that we proposed in order to get uh, parts of downtown cleaned up, especially along 18th and Cavile and along uh, uh, that 18th Street corridor. Well, thank you for that. And that's uh, specifically to 18th Street is where I'm speaking. My grandparents have lived there 75 years. Um, and the issue that we have mostly is whether they're housed or not, whether they're out during the day, they're still committing criminal acts. So that's something I hope that you'll focus on. I know that we don't want to criminalize homelessness and I don't want to criminalize them for being homeless, but while they're not being sheltered and they're out doing things that are not acceptable, I hope that we're working to enforce legal uh, actions against them because while well, we're providing them a home, which is noble and great, if they're still not following the law during the day, it's still, not, it's still impacting the quality of life for downtown. So thank you. And thank you. And I, I'll just quickly respond to that. You know, our police department responds to crime. So if an individual is committing a crime, the police department will respond. I will, I'm, I'm not going to generalize one person's experience or one group's experience and say that all these people are this, that, or the third. But I will say that whether you're homeless, whether you're having a mental health crisis, whether whether you're a youth on the street, whether you're me, you, or anybody else on this Zoom, if you're committing a crime, you're going to be dealt with uh, through law enforcement. Thank you, Mayor Thorpe. Um, Patrick, did you want to uh, ask a question once again? He's not on here anymore. Not anymore. Okay, okay, I was looking. Probably. No, no, just a minute. He's coming in from the waiting room. He logged off and he's coming back in. Oh, okay, perfect. Let's see. Well, let's see. Well, while we are waiting for him, um, does anyone else have a question? I don't have a question, but a comment. I mean, the homeless problem isn't just in Antioch. I live in downtown Brentwood. And I can tell you that as soon as people go home from work or leave the restaurants, you notice it right away. So it's not just Antioch. It's not just, they're in Oakley along the canal, underneath the railroad tracks, so it's everywhere. 
Speaking of that, I do have a question going back to Aaron Meadows <clears throat> regarding the um, train station when it goes in, if there's been any talks about making sure that homeless encampments um, don't start building around that train um, train station there. Your plans of extra patrol or keeping them? I know Oakley's been pretty good about keeping them out of the city, but it's still a concern. I, I've heard that concern. Um, I'm not, obviously, I'm, I'm sitting right by the platform right now. It's it's you know right across the street from where I'm at. I don't think, and maybe I'm wrong. I don't think it's going to be some big problem on that platform. Uh, but if it is, uh, OPD will address it, and and city staff will address it. I do want to make another comment too, and this is to everybody on the panel. Um, I think it's crazy to think that you're going to get rid of homelessness ever. Um, that's just, there's way too much factor, where way too many factors leading into it with mental health, drug abuse, financial, but um, a, an area of concern for that is some of the fires that have started because they are, you know, cooking or doing whatever, like what, what can we do or what can um, our services do to make sure that people and surrounding property is kind of being watched or taken care of because of that? I'll take a turn, give Mayor Thorpe a break. Uh, we're, we're bound by some of the state laws and also the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeal laws about what we can and can't do with homeless. They now have an unfettered right to sit, lie, and sleep on public land without being disturbed. And that is complicating life, quality of life for most of our residents. But fires, obviously, if they're starting fires, that's a criminal issue. And our police departments from all the cities would respond to that if we're called upon. So we encourage residents to be vigilant and call over call. And we'll respond and ferret out whether it's a crime or whether it's just a kind of quality of life issue that we're, we're bound by the law and and. and challenging we're trying to address. And if I can add to that, uh, I, and thank you for pointing out that we ourselves will never end homeless. It's it's a challenging national phenomenon that's taking place. It's not unique to, to California. It's not unique to the Bay Area. It's everywhere. Uh, and how we deal with it with it yeah, is, is um, there are smart ways of doing it, and then there are just dumb ways of doing it. And thinking that we're going to push people from corner to corner, I think, is the dumb way. But uh, I will say Governor Newsom proposed homeless court uh, in the next budget, in the budget cycle. I think that is so important in our ability uh, to try to alleviate some of the, in, to ensuring people get the care that they need. Uh, and especially when you look at uh, where these complaints are driven from, they're not driven by, you know, the mom who lives in a car with two kids uh, or someone couch surfing. Uh, they're driven by these encampments that can be dangerous, uh, not only uh, because of property damage, but because of, of, um, of uh, uh, because of public health overall. Human waste is a real thing. Needles can be a real thing. And then all these things go into our waterways and then end up on the Delta. And that's the same water we're pumping right back into people's homes. So these are real, these are real challenges that we're dealing with. Uh, and so homeless court would give us the opportunity to finally, uh, as Tim pointed out, you know, people have people who are experiencing homelessness have a, have have rights, and we have to respect those rights. Um, but homeless court would give us the opportunity to finally, and I hate using the word force, but finally force people who sh who need care, who are a danger not only to themselves but to the general public overall, to get the care that they need, so that we can get them on the right track. Thank you, Mayor Thorpe. Um, let's see, I know that Patrick uh, had a, another question. Patrick, um, do you want to try to ask a question once again? No, Jody asked my question. Oh, she did. Okay, perfect. All right. Does anyone else have any other questions? I, I would like to make a comment, I think, um, since we're talking about homeless. And, you know, my biggest... Um, issue let's say or concern is and it seems like we're addressing is there's so many people that are legitimately 
uh, on the edge or, or legitimately would like a place to stay and would need transition. And we spend you know, probably 80% or more of our resources on the habitual people that are, are very happy to, to be where they are. They're not, you know, it's a misnomer. They have a home, it's at Bush. And there's a huge amount of those people that, you know, they've been around since the dawn of time. So, so we're not gonna help them until they're ready to be helped. But I don't like that so many people get marginalized that need help because we're focusing all our help on, you know, the, the bad actors. So I like this court idea. Newsom did that when he was mayor of San Francisco. And I think things like that will help. Uh, I know our biggest challenge is the courts giving them rights. You know, in LA, they can have a, a refrigerator for God's sakes, you know, and furniture, you know, in the, in the public domain. But, um, but I would like to see us try to try to focus on the, uh, the people that need help and want help. So, so I applaud all the efforts of, especially Mayor Thorpe. I know that's a big uh, hot button for him. And, and I thank everybody for doing that. Thank you, Patrick. Um, anyone else have any uh, questions or comments? I have a question. Go ahead. Since I've been fielding questions, I have a question for all of you. <laughs> what do you see the impact with the inflation and mortgage rates going up doing to the housing market over the rest of this calendar year? And how should cities be better prepared for I don't know, potential recessions or impacts to our finances because of it? Anyone want to answer that question? James? Well, yeah, is James talking? Who's talking? Uh, I thought you were going to speak. Well, <laughs> go ahead, Patrick. You, know, what, you want to the, go ahead? You know, the, the NRA economist and CAR, CAR and uh, as, um, as well as, you know, like the Zillow and all the rest of the, the regional people like Redfin, you know, most of them project and, and this is what should happen is the interest rates going up will have a cooling on the market, which we've already seen. It hasn't stopped it, but you know, instead of 20 offers at 200 over, we're seeing five offers, you know, and we're still seeing some of them being 100,000 over asking. You know, a lot of that depends on where the house is priced to begin with. You know, so for instance, you know, as you get over the hill, Alameda County, they consistently price the houses very low for multiple offers and for higher offers. Out here, not so much. But we are seeing, um, you know, the days on market have doubled from three days to, you know, seven, but that's still, you know, an active market. Um, you know, as the stock market, which has just been shattered this week, um, you know, hopefully that'll come back because a lot of people are using that. But overall, our California economy is very strong, as everybody knows. And our market here in this region, the Delta region is driven largely by, uh, you know, the Silicon Valley and the Dublin markets, people that are moving here because they can work at home. The work at home appears to be staying. Um, you know, the Bar Association just closed their offices in San Francisco because of the work at home dynamic. Um, so we're continuing to see an embracing of the work at home movement, which is fueling our market out here. Um, barring any, you know, acts of God or anything that's, that's out of the, the normal, um, you know, we should see a cooling of the market uh, you know, eventually there'll be a dip because it is cyclic and that's just the way things happen. Uh, nobody anticipates a, a giant dip like we had in the recession and, you know, the 06 to 08 period uh, because the factors aren't there. The people that are paying $200,000 over asking price are not doing it with 100% financing and variable rate loans. Most of the people in the past, you know, 10 years in this market run up have been getting 30 year fixed financing loans and they've been paying the overages with, you know, larger down payments. So, so we have equity, we have solid loans with fixed payments. So we don't have the same factors. Also, people have been actually qualified, you know, back in 06, you know, there was very, very minimal qualifications. That isn't happening today. So, so the factors that, that happened then aren't in place today. So you know, we do not anticipate anything like that 40 or 50% drop in value. We should see somewhere between a five or 10% market correction, you know, um, eventually, but you know, that could be still three to five years down the road. Great, thank you, that's helpful. I, I don't see a market correction. I don't see, or I don't see prices dropping anytime soon. Uh, but I mean, like what I would tell uh, our city, uh, our city manager is that um, I expect our, our property taxes to continue to grow. 
maybe not like they've grown the last few years, but I was I expect probably a three to four percent increase. Thank you, Aaron. Um, James, um, did you have something to say as well? Sure, the one thing I would tell the cities to look out for is, well, it's fantastic that we still have such a high demand for purchasing homes. We also have that high demand for the rentals and the prices are drastically increasing. We're finding a larger gap for those people and some of them are having to relocate or they're spending a significant amount of their income on housing, which is impacting the rest of their discretionary spending. So you're gonna see more of a pull on your local resources, less on that discretionary spending um, and I think that's going to be something you should be aware of as well. Thank you, James. Um, anyone else has any uh, comments or questions or concerns? Okay, I don't see anybody. So I think we'll end it right here. Um, just wanna thank over uh, city panelists for being here again. Uh, thank you. Uh, Director Jordan Davis, uh, City Manager Tim Ogden, sorry, and um, or Oakley Vice Mayor Aaron Meadows and or Antioch Mayor Lamar Thorpe. Thank you guys so much for joining and thank you everyone for uh, coming today. I hope we got some great information and uh, have a great day and a great weekend ahead. Thank you, Ralph. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.